Okay, let us pray together. Our gracious Father, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you made us clean. And now we have this hope that we will join you in eternal heaven. Thank you for our salvation and thank you for your love and grace for us. And we know you are leading us every day and, and you gave us the Bible so that we can obey and we can trust you and we can live for eternal glory. So Lord, sometimes our heart is tempted by the world, by Satan. But please lead us and guide us so that we do not waste any time in this world. But we can just glorify you whatever we do. Today, you have gathered us again. So Lord, please lead us and open our hearts so that we can learn all the lessons from the scripture. From the beginning to the end, I commit the rest of time unto your mighty hand. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, let's open the Bible. First uh, Kings chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12. And verses 25 to uh, 33. First Kings chapter 12. Verse 25 to 33. If you have found it, let's read it together. Then Jeroboam built Sechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of these people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore, the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as then. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained the feast on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel, he installed the priest of the high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained the feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. Here we see uh, the King Jeroboam. Do you know King Jeroboam? Yes, he was the first king of northern Israel because the kingdom of Israel has been divided into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Why? Because of the sin of Solomon. Solomon had too many wives and at the end he was worshipping idols. And as a punishment, God took ten tribes from the house of David and gave them to Jeroboam. So here, this is the story of Jeroboam today, and we learn many lessons from the mistakes of King Jeroboam, because uh, there are many lessons we can learn from what he did as the first king of Israel. Um, verse 25, Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there, and he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of uh, David. So, let's think about this one, this scripture. The, the problem, the mistakes of Jeroboam was, he had his own idea in his heart. And he followed his own idea and plan and he committed sins before God. So let's see what, what happened uh, for him. 
Jeroboam said in his heart, verse 26 says, in his heart. You know, many things going on in our heart, many of them are just lust of our flesh. You know, our heart wants to lead us to worldly pleasure, but we should not follow them. We should follow and obey the word of God. So here, um, we see Jeroboam was concerned that what happens you know, when people, they have to go to Jerusalem to worship God because that's where the temple is. And when people go there to the Judah, the, another kingdom now, two kingdoms, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. But Jerusalem, the center of the worship was in Jerusalem in the southern Judah. So he was thinking, what if people go there and worship God and maybe their heart might turn to the king of Judah, Rehoboam, and they might kill me. So let's do something. Let's do something. So this is the problem. In his heart, whatever he thought in his heart, it is not wise. You know, as a human, we have limited knowledge. We are not perfect. Our judgment is not also perfect. That's why God gave us the Bible so that we can obey and we can follow. The best way for your Christian life is always asking God and asking for His, His way, His idea. So let's uh, bookmark here. In the book of Judges, that's what we see. Judges chapter 1, verse 1. Judges chapter 1, verse 1. Israel people, after Joshua died, they started very well by asking God. Uh, Judges chapter 1, verse 1. Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? So after Joshua died, the leader, the great leader, is not with them anymore. So the first thing they did was they asked God, God, who will go first to fight against these Canaanites? And God said, Judah will go first. And they won victory. However, at the end of Judges, let's go to the end of Judges, um, chapter 21, verse 25. The very end, last verse of uh, the book of Judges. Let's see what happened to them. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The king was God, but they abandoned their own king God, and then they did Whatever. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That was failure. You see, they started well by asking God, but now they are following whatever they think in their heart. And that is the problem. That's what Jeroboam did. In the scripture, we see many people who, is, who thinks they are wise, who thinks their idea is better than God's. And that's why people fail again and again. Let's uh, turn to Rome, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Verse 19. Uh, Romans chapter 2. Verse 19. Uh, Romans chapter 2 verse 19. And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. You think you are wise. And you think you can guide people. You are the teachers. You are reading the books. And you think you have some knowledge. And you think in certain area, you know better than God. So here, they are confident that you yourself are guide to the blind. No, you have to know. You are blind actually, right? Only God is wise. We have to see the truth in the Bible. The Bible is the only truth. God created us and God gave us the Bible so that he wanted to show us the best way for us. His love, his wisdom, his power, his grace, his salvation, whatever he planned for us, we come to know through the Bible. 
Uh, people do not listen to God. They think they are wise. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. So even though through the nature, through the Bible, through their conscience, they know God is there, but they do not obey God. And in verse 22, they profess to be wise, means they think they are wise enough to live on their own way. And when they keep following their own way, they end up in eternal hell, eternal destruction. They profess to be wise, but they are not wise. So let's think about this one. We should not follow our own idea. And that's what Jeroboam did. There are people who think they are doing great. They think they are very smart. I met many of those people. They say, I know in this area, uh, I'm doing very well. However, do they know the truth? For example, in your life, what is uh, your purpose of life, goal of life? Do you know what happens after you die? Even as a Christian, do you know what kind of glory God prepared for your work in this world? Do you know what is the true happiness? Do you know when something happens in your life, like an accident or sickness or death of your close friends or your family members, do you know the will of God? Our life is full of mystery. But there are people who think they are doing well, they are boasting. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians. Chapter 10, verse 12. Second Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 12. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who command themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. They do not ask God for his wisdom, but they measure themselves with, uh, by themselves. They comparing themselves among themselves. They are not wise. Maybe they might be smart among people, but compared to the wisdom of God, they are nothing. They are blind. One time, Jesus said, you Pharisees, you are blind. Actually, they asked Jesus, are we blind? Well, if you know you're blind, you have, a, you have a chance to learn, but you don't even know you are blind. We are blind. Without God, we are in darkness. Only when we, we acknowledge that we are in darkness and we are blind, God will show us light, God will guide us. But the Pharisees, they said, we are not blind. We know the truth. Right? Let's look to John. Chapter 9, verse 39, John, Gospel of John. Chapter 9, verse 39 to 41, 39 to 41. John chapter 9, verse 39 to 41. Let's read it together. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see, ma see may see, and those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. You see here, let's acknowledge before God. God, we are blind. We know nothing. We have no truth in ourselves. We are very foolish. We make mistakes again and again. But these Pharisees, they are the ones who are very proud. They are the ones, I know, 
I know things, you know. Don't tell me. Um, don't try to teach me the Bible because I know. And they were asking Jesus, are we blind also? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. If you acknowledge you are blind, then you will come to Jesus to see the light. And when you learn from Jesus, you will be saved and you will have no sin. But you say, uh, we see, we see, we can see. And Jesus said, therefore your sin remains. There was one survey among 1,000 people. It's very interesting. In this survey, 70% of people among these 1,000 people, 75,000 people thought, said, Mother Teresa, she would go to heaven. 79%. But when they were asked about themselves, they said, 87% of people said, they will go to heaven. So you see, 79% of people thought Mother Teresa would go to heaven, and she did great work in India. She took care of the poor people. She sacrificed her whole life to help others. But 79% people said she would end up in heaven, but 87% said they will go to heaven. And Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate. And Jesus said, there are many people who want to enter heaven, but they cannot. So it's contradictory, right? Who is right, Jesus or the people? Of course, uh, regarding Mother Teresa, we don't know exactly where, where she went to heaven or not. But one thing is sure. Uh, no matter how, many, how much good work she did, she cannot go to heaven with her own good work. Because salvation is not by work, but by faith. We do not know whether she had the you know, true faith or not. Jesus, he is always a good example for us. And he always said, I'm not saying my own word. I say whatever God the Father told me to say. You see here, even Jesus was so obedient to Father. Do you, are you obedient to, to your father and mother? Even though we know the fifth law in the Ten Commandments is obey and respect to your father and mother, we do not do that. But Jesus showed a good example. John chapter 5, verse 30. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 30. John chapter 5, verse 30. Let's read it together. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of Father who sent me. I can of myself do nothing. Jesus did nothing of himself. He did nothing on his own. And he said, my, I, I do not seek my own will, but the will of Father who sent me. You see here, Jesus showed a great example for us. In our life, after salvation, we have to do the will of Father and will of Father only. Nothing but the will of Father. Jesus didn't follow his own idea. He didn't say from his heart, but he just said and done. He has said and done according to the will of God. John chapter 8, verse 28 John chapter 8, verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. Again, Jesus said, I, I do nothing of myself. I'm not doing anything on my own, but... As my father taught me, I speak these things. Whatever I say is also from father. Glorify father. Father. God the father. You know, when we follow the footsteps of Jesus Christ, that is how we should live as Christians. And even Jesus said, I do nothing of myself. 
So let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12, uh, verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. He was so concerned about people returning to the house of David. That's why he, he made the golden calves so that people worship. They didn't... They don't have to go to Jerusalem. They can worship these golden calves at Bethel and Dan, which were in Israel. There's a big problem. Because of the sin of Jeroboam, all the kings in Israel, total 19 kings, including Jeroboam, they are, were all sinful, evil. Not even a single one did right in the eyes of God. Why? It started with Jeroboam. The sin of Jeroboam was there in Israel. So do you know, let me make it clear. What is the sin of Jeroboam? God, when God chose Jeroboam, he already gave the promises. Do you know that? Uh, Jer uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, 11, verse 29 to 31. The previous chapter, chapter, chap chapter 11, verse 29 to 31. Uh, let's read it together. Now it happened at the time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, met him on the way and he had clothed himself with a new garment and the two were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. You see the promise of God? I will give ten tribes to you, Jeroboam. You will be the king. Not only that, verse 37 and 38, this is the promise of God. If you obey me, I will bless you. And I will make your house enduring forever. So, verse uh, 37 and 38, let's read it together. So I will take you, and you shall reign over all your heart desires, and you shall be king over Israel. Then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house as I built for David and will give Israel to you you see this promise is amazing I will make your house like the house of David I will make your house an enduring house it is so clear that God wanted to bless Jeroboam. Just keep my statutes and keep my commandments and obey my word and everything will be well. Yes, it was the promise of God. But Jeroboam didn't trust God. He didn't believe God. He, he, he had no faith in God. He was worried. What if people turn to the house of David? They will kill me. Well, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, let's not make the same mistake as King Jeroboam did because, you know, do you know the promise of God for you? When God saved us, of course, our sins uh, were all washed away. The blood of Jesus covered all our sins. And God said, I don't even remember your sins. Your sins and lowly deeds, I will not remember. And Jesus paid double for our sins. And from eternity to eternity, from our birth to death, and from the eternity to eternity, all our sins have been washed away because Jesus obtained eternal redemption, eternal forgiveness, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. So salvation... Is obtained by faith. But that's not the end of story. After we become saved, after we become God's child, from that time on also, our Christian life begins and it will be ending with faith or so. Faith. Faith in God. Faith in the promises of God is our Christian life. 
And do you remember in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus gave us promises. Seek first the kingdom of God, then everything else will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God, then I will take care of your life. I will take care of your financial life. I will take care of your family. I will take care of your study, your business, your work. Everything else will be added unto you. Do you know that uh, because God is invisible, maybe, you know, we forget how to trust God. Some brother sister says, Pastor, I have to make money. I have to, you know, I have to take care of my family and uh, I need money. So I cannot come to the church on Sundays because I have to work. What do you think? Do you think God doesn't know that you need money? Do you think um, if you do not join the fellowship because you have something to do, or for example, you have an exam, so some are students, and then you think that, oh, I have to study. Well, without God's blessing, without God's blessing, nothing can happen. Some brother, sister, you know, when you become sick, for example, you cannot do anything, right? Even if you make money, if you are sick, you spend a lot of time for your sickness, you have nothing left. The, the first thing you have to really make sure after you become born again is, yes, God's promise is trustworthy. I have to trust God. Christian life is faith life. Faith. We have to trust God. Listen to Matthew chapter 6. Because after salvation, the first difficulty for us is what to eat, what to wear, and how we can manage our uh, lives. So here, verse 31, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, 32. Let's read it together. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. God already knows. And God just says, obey. Right? After entering the land of Canaan, God commanded Israelites, just circle around Jericho, which was a strong fortress. They were to conquer Jericho. But God said, just, just walk around. Don't do anything. Even don't say anything. Be silent. But on the last day, circle around Jericho seven times and shout and the, the world will come down. Can you believe? Well, they trusted God at the time and they won great victory. So, Many times in our Christian life, we have to choose between the Word of God or your own idea. The Word of God or your own flesh. You know, sometimes we do not obey God because we are following the lust of our flesh. You want to watch television instead of reading the Bible. You want to surf the internet and play the game, computer games. And you do not come to the church it's all before us, the word of God or the desire of your flesh or your own idea. Jeroboam made a great mistake following his own idea. He didn't trust God. Uh, in the Bible, I will just give you some examples of those who trusted God and they experienced great blessing of God. For example, Naaman, the general Naaman, who was a leper, he came to Israel because he heard there's a prophet who can heal him, a you know, leper. He was a general, great general, but he was a leper. He had a leprosy. And Elisha, the prophet, he didn't even come to see Naaman, but he just sent one messenger saying, Naaman, wash in the river Jordan seven times. Then your flesh will become like that of the, the flesh of the baby, of a baby. 
Of course, Naaman, he didn't trust God in the beginning. Let's, let's see 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 10 to 12. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 10 to 12. Let's read it together. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Parpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the rivers of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. You see here, Naaman, he's, when he, he heard that um, you know, he should wash himself seven times in the river of Jordan, he got furious, he got angry. Let's hear what he said uh, in verse 11. Indeed, I said to myself, you see here again, indeed, I said to myself, this is my idea, this is my thought. What? He will surely come. The prophet will surely come out to me. He should see me. And stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. He, he should pray to God. And wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. You know, I have this idea. But what? Wash seven times in the river Jordan? Don't we have better rivers in Assyria, Damascus? He got furious. You know, that is the reaction of the people sometimes. Regarding salvation, I met some people saying, oh, I can just believe and I can go to heaven. Isn't it too simple? Isn't it too simple? Really? I, I don't have to come to church and I, have, I don't have to uh, offer tithe or I, I don't have to pray or I, I, I don't have to uh, do anything for my salvation? Just listen? Yes. Unbelievable, right? The only reason why we are believing that way is because that's what the Bible tells us. God loved, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So here, Naaman, he had his own idea, but uh, he couldn't understand what Elisha said. And then he said, I will go back. Well, if he have just gone back to his home country without washing, he would have died as a leper. Very miserable life. But let's see what happened. Verse 13 and 14. Verse 13 and 14. Let's read it together. And his servant came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. You see here, he had a very wise servant. The servant said, Father, like a, in a respectable way, if the prophet had told you to do something great, something more difficult, wouldn't, wouldn't you do that? Wouldn't you just try? You came all the way and you know that the prophet of God in Israel, he, you heard about his, uh, he has a healing power and he's the one who performed many miracles. So wouldn't, wouldn't you just try at least uh, something? Even, even if it's uh, more difficult or greater than just washing seven times in the river Jordan? Well, you have to listen. Sometimes God talks to to you through people around you, like your family members. Family members. If your mother is a faithful uh, sister, you listen to her. Your father and mother, all they want is your own benefit, your own happiness. Listen to them. You know, what, what they would expect from you, your own happiness. Right? God talks to you through Godly people. So here, Naaman went down and dipped seven times. 
first time, second time, up to six times, nothing happens. That's when you need faith, actually. If you just give up there, you don't see anything. Seven means perfect. Seven means perfect. God expects perfect, absolute faith in God. What is our salvation? Salvation, we know Jesus did everything for us. We just trust him, believe him. Then we, our sins are all forgiven. So Naaman here, he experienced something mir miraculous. His flesh became like the flesh of a little child. It means so, so smooth, actually. So, so such a nice and soft skin. I think uh, it was wonderful for him. What God wants from you is faith. Let me tell you another story. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21, verse 8 and 9. Numbers chapter 21, verse 8 and 9. Let's read it together. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be dead everyone who is bitten. When he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Because of the sin of Israel, uh, God sent a fiery serpent. A fiery serpent means a poisonous serpent, and uh, those who were bitten by the serpent, they were dying, and then they cried out to God, God help us, save us. And verse 8, God, God talked to Moses saying, Make a fiery serpent uh, with bronze and put it on a pole. So whoever look at it, whoever beholds it, they will be healed. Let me tell you, the bronze serpent has no power. The Jewish people, they kept this bronze serpent hundreds of years after this, this incident because they thought bronze serpent had the power. No, no, no. The power is with the word of God. God said, God said, look at the bronze serpent and you will be healed. So verse 9, so Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. So it was, if a serpent had beaten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Why you cannot trust God? Why you do not obey God? Isn't God almighty God? Isn't God a loving God? Isn't God uh, the one who gave his own son? He did not spare his own son. Isn't he willing to give everything to you? Just obey the word of God. Then God will bless you so much. Do you know that uh, many brothers and sisters has, uh, have a burden of preaching the gospel because uh, we know the reason why we are living is the spreading the good news, uh, evangelizing other people. But people do not listen to us. They reject us and they say, go away. They hurt us and we give up. And some are wondering, Why? Why God gave us this commission of preaching the gospel is such a burden. Well, it's not a burden, let me tell you. By the way, in Acts chapter 11, when there was one Roman centurion, Cornelius, he was a godly man but not saved. Angel appeared to him and said to him, go to Joppa, send some people, some of your soldiers to Joppa and get Peter. He will come and preach the gospel. And there, you have to think about this one. Angel appeared to him. Could an angel just preach the gospel? You know, I think if angel had spoken to him, it might have been easier to believe than when Peter spoke, actually. You know, Peter, a Jew. He was a fisherman, not so educated. But God uses a born-again Christian to preach the gospel. Not angel. Not even angel. Angel is powerful. But God does not let them to preach the gospel. Why? Because it's our, it's our privilege. When a soul is saved, God is so happy. There will be feast over one saved soul. Some retreat is coming. Maybe some of you never attended our summer retreat. Usually, 10,000 brothers and sisters, 10,000 people come together. Many are uh, newcomers, and they listen to the word of God, and hundreds of people, they take baptism at the end of 
at the at the last on the last day of the uh, life first, uh, the the summer retreat, and I believe this is a great chance to work for the glory of God. Of course, it's very hard, and you know I I, I sweat a lot actually. I'm sweating, so for me, just being there. Sometimes I suffer. However, I know that it is a privilege for us to work together. And once you attend the summer retreat, you grow so much in your Christian life. You'll miss it again and again. You want to attend it again and again. Um, last time one pastor was telling me, he attended the summer retreat 33 times. You know, we started like 33 years, maybe, I don't know. Um, that was before I was born again. So, anyway, just trust God, obey God. Here, the bronze serpent has no power, but the word of God. Let's go back to 1 Kings uh, chapter 12. Um, Jeroboam made many mistakes, actually. Uh, let's see what kind of mistake he made. Verse 28, 28 to 30, let me read uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28 to 30. Therefore, the king asked advice, made two cups of gold, and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one as far as then. So he made the calves of the gold and said to the people, Worship these calves. This, this is God who brought you out of Egypt. Of course, it was an idol. God said, Do not make any image. Do you know why God said, Do not make any image of God? Because God is so almighty God, if, if we just make image, we are limiting his power. We think that God is like that image we make. No, God is much greater than that, much bigger than that, much more powerful than that. So that's why we should not confine God in one, some image, right? So he made these uh, two cups. And let's see, uh, in verse 28, he says something interesting. It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. It's too much means... It's not convenient, too far. One time I remember, you know, in America, I used to study there, and then I wanted to attend the summer retreat, which was held in Los Angeles. And I was in the eastern coast. So at the time, I drove uh, with one brother. I drove a truck, a van, 50 hours. We drove 5,000 kilometers. We kept, we turn, uh, we kept turn, uh, turn, in driving, so we arrived in Los Angeles for the summer retreat in 50 hours, and we spent wonderful time, uh, three nights, four days, I guess, uh, I believe, and then we came back again, driving 50 hours again, and we drove 10,000 kilometers at the time, from Washington, D.C. to L.A., you know, up and down, 10,000 kilometers. We drove 100 hours. It is too much. Too much these days people say why we go to the summer retreat they can broadcast on YouTube like a YouTube live of course we we could broadcast every session on YouTube so that you don't have to go there and you can stay in a cool and nice office or house and then uh, you know drinking nice uh, like a juice you know comfortable way well that is the beginning actually Three times a year, the Jewish people had to go to Jerusalem to worship God. Why three times? Because at the time, their heart was for God. Right? So, it is too much. Don't say too much. Uh, bring your Bible. You know? These days, people say, oh, we have a mobile phone, smartphone. We can download some app with many versions of the Bible, so it's very handy. I know it's handy. But, when you read in a book form, it's better, actually, right? Don't say it's too much. That's what Jeroboam said. And also verse 31, 
He made the shrines on the high places and made the priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Rev Levi. Another mistake of Jeroboam. He, no, he made people not of the tribe Levi a priest, which was against the word of God. Only the Levites could, could become priests. King Saul, he offered sacrifices even though he was not priest and it was a great mistake and then God left him actually, right? So this is again disobedience. And then verse 32, Jeroboam ordained the feast on the 15th day of the 8th month like the feast that was in Judah and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel, he installed the priests of high places which he had made. So he made some feast, something similar to that of Judah, something similar to that of uh, that what God ordained, actually. Many things, many traditions, and uh, something similar, actually. Well, Satan, Satan, he makes many things uh, similar to what God commanded in the Bible. Tradition. So, in the time of Jesus, they were following tradition, and when Jesus did not ke keep the tradition, they were, they were against Jesus, and they rebuked Jesus, actually. That's why they did not accept Jesus, because Jesus broke their tradition. Something similar. Even these days, you have to be very careful. Not every church is church in the Bible. The church is not building. Church means the assembly of truly born again people. There are many church. The biggest church in the world is in Korea. But this might not be the church in God's sight because how many are the church members are truly born again? That's what matters. Satan made many things similar, different gospel. Satan made another Jesus so that people follow. They think this, they are the genuine Jesus, genuine gospel, but they are counterfeit. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. Let's read it together. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Yes, there's another Jesus. Another Jesus means they add something more to the gospel. They added something more to the blood of Jesus. Like uh, in Pentecostal, Pentecostal churches, they say you have to speak tongue to be saved. And some of the churches, they say you have to understand something more than the gospel. Or you, know, you have to keep coming to the church every Sunday. If you add something to the gospel, it's not gospel. Gospel is the gift of God. It's not of our work. We just take it with our faith. In verse 13 and 14, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 and, uh, 13 and 14. Let's read it together. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. Yes, Satan, if Satan appears like with horns and then in a terrible way, um, then nobody would follow Satan. So Satan transformed himself into the angel of light. One Christian, uh, Ironside, he said, even if angel appears to me and said, oh, you are born again, you are saved, I would not trust him. I only trust the word of God, the Bible. Because if just, you know, angel appeared to me and said, you are born again, but when I was um, dying, he appears before me again and said, well, 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 you are deceived. I'm not an angel, actually. And then when he uh, removes his cover and then, you know, he turns out to be a devil. And he said, let's go to hell. So he said, I don't trust even angel. 
Yes, that's good because Satan transformed himself into an angel. Only the word of God. Your salvation, your Christian life, you have to make sure they are according to God's will. How? If your faith is according to the word of God, not human tradition, human idea, that's what God wants from you. And let's see what happened to Israel and you know, the kingdom of Israel later after Jeroboam. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 17. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 17. Verse 21, 23. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 21 to 23. Let's read it together. For he tore Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. Then Jeroboam drove Israel from following the law and made them commit a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, they did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria, as it is to this day. There were 19 kings in Israel, including Jeroboam, all evil. So in B.C. 722, God, God delivered Israel into the hands of Assyria, and they were destroyed. Here, uh, verse 23, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight. God was waiting, waiting, very patient, because 19 kings, think about it, 19 ki kings were evil, but God did not remove Israel right away. He was waiting, waiting, until they repent, but they didn't, and then God removed them out of his sight. So here, let's remember, the sin of one person is important, sin of one person. Jeroboam, he made two calves and put them in Bethel and Dan. And that was the beginning. And that's why God removed them out of, their, out of his sight. Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. Again and again, the kings of Israel followed the way of Jeroboam. So, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha, saying, Inasmuch as I lifted you out of the dust and made you ruler over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam, and have made my people Israel sin, to provoke me to anger with their sins. So Baasha, the king of Israel, he followed the way of Jeroboam. He walked in the way of Jeroboam. And he provoked God to anger. So let's remember. Maybe you are the first one in your family who got saved. And the fate of all your family members depend upon what kind of Christian you are. If you obey God, there's a promise that God will not just save you alone, but God will save the household, your household, your family members also, if you obey God. Right? But all the kings of Israel, they walked in the way of Jeroboam. What about David? He was the one whose heart was after God. So, the sin of one person is important. Jeroboam, he didn't trust God actually. That's why he was worried and he made mistakes. And because of his sin, the whole nation was destroyed. Eventually. Uh, let's turn to Galatians chapter 5, the last verse. Galatians chapter 5. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Let's read it together. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. So here, the spirit is there, and the lust of your flesh is there. Uh, in Romans chapter 7, Apostle Paul said, 
He wants to obey God. He wants to fulfill the will of God. But there's another law, the lust of flesh. So they fight. It's a spiritual battle. And the only way to win victory in this spiritual battle is walking in the spirit, obeying the word of God, reading the Bible, memorize them, meditate on them, apply them in your life. And that's how you grow more and more. For the flesh lost against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. Contrary. There are always two ways before you. Obeying God and following Satan. Those who, who go to hell, they follow Satan until the end. That's why they go to hell because hell was made for, created for Satan, not for people. So now, even after salvation, still we have two ways before us, following the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, or uh, doing everything according to the lust of the flesh. So what would you do? Do not follow the way of Jeroboam. Do not walk in the way of Jeroboam. Because, let's see, how Israel ended. God removed them. Of course, our salvation is secure. So don't worry about losing your salvation. But what happens to you is, uh, in John chapter 15, Jesus said, if branch is connected to the vine, they will bear many fruits. But if the branch is cut off from the vine, they cannot bear any fruits and they will be, you know, people will trample on them. Even people, unbelievers, they do not respect you. They will, do, they will despise you and then even they will uh, somehow persecute you. So Jeroboam, the first king of Israel, because of his sin, the whole nation of Israel, they went wrong. So let's do not make uh, such mistakes. And let's trust God and acknowledge God in our life, in even the small things in our life. So that everything can be done according to, according to the will of God, as Jesus did uh, in his earthly life. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, today we learned some lessons from the King Jeroboam, the first king of Israel. Even though, Lord, you gave the promises and you, you blessed him by making him the king of Israel, he didn't obey you. And he, he made mistakes again and again. And he made the whole Israel sin before God. So Lord, in our heart also, sometimes we are struggling. And sometimes our flesh is so strong. For example, some retreat. No. Our flesh doesn't like to go there because it's too much, too hard. To many people, not so comfortable. But Lord, we know you are there. You are working there. And you are saving so many people through the summer retreat. And that's why we, are, we should be there. Because you are there working. So why we should take rest, not working, when you are working. So Lord, change our heart and help us so that we can again and again um, obey you and grow more in our Christian life. And we can glorify you by bearing many fruits in our Christian life until Jesus comes again. So thank you so much for this time. And in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.